It is so important that we set, you know, the floor high in that area. Um, communication offensively, formally, and informally. Hadn't been around a good defense that doesn't adjust fast and communicate while doing so. And so that's, that's at the top of our list in terms of our attention uh, as we get started. You are looking live at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and Steelers Training Camp 2024, day three on campus, day two on the practice field. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Training Camp Live presented by FedEx. I'm Mike Pursuta, joined as always for these morning programs by Max Starks, and it is our pleasure to kick things off today with a very special guest, Steelers General Manager Omar Khan is seated between Max and myself. Omar, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Max, always a pleasure. Uh, you know, we heard from you yesterday, as we traditionally do. Well, you haven't been here that long as GM, but yep. a little bit of a habit of doing a camp opening press conference. Yep. And uh, you mentioned how much you like the environment here at St. Vincent College. Uh, Mike Tomlin's yeah. on the same page. Seemingly everybody associated with the Steelers loves it out here. W what's the attraction? How does this enhance team building? Yeah, I, I do love it here. It's, it, it's awesome. You know, the offseason was great uh, on the south side. It was really productive, but just – to have the ability here to be around our fans, you know, listen to them react and cheer for us uh, based on what's happening out there. It's just, it's awesome. And, you know, you can't really replicate from a football standpoint. You know, I, I, I believe this gives us the ability to maybe minimize some distractions as we're getting ready and trying to get better for over the next couple of weeks. It's, it's awesome. I mean, I, I honestly, I, I love being out here. It's 20 plus years for me here and uh, it's, it's been great. Competition's always a big part of this. Yep. They, they schedule those competition periods into the practices. Uh, is there a position or two that uh, you're especially interested in seeing how that competition plays out? You, you know, really all of them. It's early. You know, I'm excited. I'm really excited about the 90, 90 men we have here. And uh, it's really all of them. You know, I, I, I don't wanna really want to talk about just one specific because, uh, you know, we started watching film on practice yesterday, and, and you know, we're really – keyed in on, on every single one of them. There's some good competitions out here this year. It, it really is. It's going to be fun to watch and confident that uh, over the next few weeks it'll all sort out. But, uh, yeah, it look, looks overall the whole team. All right, Omar. I'm, I'm going to switch it to the offensive side of the ball. Okay. And I have a feeling this is an O-line question from you. It w we'll get Maybe there. Right, we're going right, to get right, to right, that right. one. I mean, it's a part of the soup du jour, right? <laughs> but, you know, having a new O.C., having four new quarterbacks on this roster, and like you said, some new pieces on the offensive line, kind of the expectation for how that gelling process is going to go. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, it's been great. That process really started, uh, you know, in the spring. We have a lot of new faces, uh, coaching staff uh, on the pl uh, with the players. Uh, it's already started, um, and it's just, it continues to grow every single day. I mean, that's why we're here. Um, and, I, and I'm confident that it, uh, it's headed in the right direction. Is there like a timing associated that you want to see kind of that progression going as far as w as we get through camp? Obviously, pads is the next step and then preseason games. But is there a timing factor that you're looking well, at in that I'll, process? I'll just say regardless of w the position, you, we want to see where we're at uh, the last day versus the first day, you know, and the improvement. And that's what we want to see regardless of position. Okay. When you guys decided to make the moves at quarterback that you made, what yep. was it specifically that uh, attracted you first to Russell Wilson and then Justin Fields shortly thereafter? Yeah, really, I, I'm excited about this QB room. You know, these guys really work hard. Uh, they're proven winners. You know, Kyle Allen and, you know, John Rye said it yesterday. John Rye has three great uh, quarterbacks really to learn from. Um, you know, how they lead the team. These guys are, are proven leaders and proven winners and, you know, those, those are characteristics that, that are important and um, feel great about it. You know, now we get to, of course, the meat of it. You know, the offensive line has obviously been a point of emphasis over the last two spring building periods, obviously taking the first two round, first round or draft picks mm -hmm. um, over the last two years. How do, you, how do you watch that position to see how they're going to get a feel for their development? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there are other positions other than the O-line. There, there offense, are, right? but, you know, I figure no. the highest concentration <laughs> is the most beautiful guys no, on the field. Love the O-linemen. <laughs> um, you know, similar, I answered it, I'll answer it similarly to one of the other questions. You know, we, we watch the progression. I mean, we want, we want to see these guys getting better every single day. We want to see where they're at the last day versus the first day. You know, we saw improvements from these guys from the first day they got there in the spring. And we expect the same type of growth and improvement um, over the next few weeks. So the, the process has already begun. You know, we watch film on these guys every day, and, you know, everybody makes mistakes. We want to see how these guys correct the mistakes and how they grow, and, you know, that's what we're looking for. All right, All right. expectations for this O-line this season. I can tell you what I feel. 
but uh, I want to hear it from you. What, what are the expectations for this group outside of the development aspect? You know, I, I'm not going to single out the O line group, but I'll say we all have the same goal in mind here. <laughs> uh, you know, to do this, to do to accomplish the goals that we want, we have to do it as a collective. And uh, I'm excited about this group, and you know, we uh, we have high go high goals and high standards for ourselves, and. Uh, Collectively, we hopefully we'll we'll get there. Sky's the limit. Okay, there it is. Well, I don't know if you're a fan <laughs> of the movie Hoosiers or not. I love uh, that movie. Love are, it. Are you Gene Hackman right about now? Is your team <laughs> on the field, or are you still maybe thinking about uh, dialing something up somewhere? You know, love the 90 guys we have here, but um, I I think every every club's the same. You know, and I've said it before. If there's ever an opportunity to 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 discuss a uh, an opportunity to upgrade your team you're going to look at it and it doesn't always work out it doesn't always make sense um uh but you know always i'd, I'd be uh, it's a smart thing to do you know we'll, we'll be smart and strategic about the decisions we make if if you're going to make such a move uh, hypothetically is it easier early later is there a more advantageous time how does that you know you would love for it all to happen on, on on the time when we want it but the reality is that it doesn't happen that way the one thing I'll say is when, when things happen later in the process, it allows you to uh, to maybe deal with adversity and see how you're going to deal with it. And, uh, y you know, it, it's hard to get ready for Sundays, as you know, Max. And, um, you know, sometimes when you when you acquire a player, whether it's, you know, a street free agent or a trade or you claim a guy and uh, late in the process, you know, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to see how you as a club and you and the player – uh, how they adjust to the adversity of getting ready for Sunday, you know, and you know sometimes you know you don't have a long window of an opportunity to prepare for for a game, and you know it's it's an opportunity. So Omar, really appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. Thank, Thank you, you, Omar. Thanks, guys. Good luck appreciate this training it. camp, and uh, don't get caught watching the paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. That is Steelers general manager Omar Khan. I didn't know he was a Hoosiers fan, Max. I, uh, hey, I have more respect new. now than I did. Before. Is that your favorite uh, sports movie? It's up there. It's up there. Yeah, it's, it's up there. There's several good too. ones, but uh, it's the raw emotion of it as well it's, as it's the sports a, it's part a great of it. Movie. When they're in that huddle and Jimmy says, "I'll make it." <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great movie. movie. Great movie. I'm a Rudy guy. I'm a Rudy I love guy. Rudy too. Love Rudy. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't look at me crazy, Mike. Yeah. Anyway, back to training <laughs> camp. <laughs> we'll get to some more movie reviews momentarily, but some stuff to review yesterday, Max. Uh, it, it, it started out uh, not the way we thought it was going to start out because when uh, the first team offense trotted out onto the field for the first time, Justin Fields was running the show. Russell Wilson uh, had a little calf issue, and uh, he was a, an observer rather than a participant. And uh, – Mike Tomlin talked about how, you know, a little curveball for the offense. You got to think and react on your feet. A little short-term misery for Russell Wilson not getting to play. A little opportunity for Justin Fields. Uh, what would you make of that, and uh, what got your attention? Well, I, I think one of the biggest things, it's day one of camp, and as you go through those issues, I know guys were – dealing with what the conditioning test was the day before. It was a very different departure from a traditional conditioning test. So some guys had some issues with that. And, you know, it, it's, it's impressive. Different. I know it was longer. Yeah. Well, no, it was, it was like, I mean, it was like CrossFit games. Normally, I mean, when we come out here, when I played especially, like we, our, our first conditioning test was 1440s. And that was it. And then when sprint, – Sprint up, walk back. Yeah, sprint, walk, walk back to the line, boom, ready again. And you have to hit 12 out of those 14. And then when and that was a time prescribed based on position and based size. on your forty time, and they added a half a second to your 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 forty time, so you had to make it within this range. And a buzzer beeped, and there's somebody at the line counting if you crossed or not, and you had to complete twelve out of the fourteen in, in the time frame. Then you moved to when we got a new strength coach because that was Chet Furman, and then when Garrett Guimont came in, Garrett created the eighteen one hundreds, so which is more a traditional college style conditioning style test where you have 20 seconds 100 yard sprint you jog back 50 walk back to the line and you're supposed to do that within a 30 second time frame and then boom you do it again and that's what you do and you have to complete all 18 of them in the time frame if you miss you got to retest and so you know teams have those different ones that you have the half gasser test where you're running the width of the field so a half gasser is down and back a full gasser is down back down back so you have those type of conditioning tests or, or the, what we call flying 300s where you start at one end of the end zone and you run around the field 
in that in that time frame, and you have to do three or four of those in the time frame. Craig Wolfley had that type of uh, conditioning test, and a lot of teams really developed that. So this one was more CrossFit style. Like you had stations, you had you know elements that you had to utilize. So pushing a sled, doing uh, doing um, different short sprints and short area quickness sprints, and then recovering and doing another station. So there was a lot of different things than what your traditional conditioning test is as we know it. You know, when I first started doing this in the 80s, the configuration of the fields was a little bit different. There were two next to each other and then one on the end. Yeah. And they would have them run around. I think it was a 350. Yeah, 350, and, and yeah. And you had to do, I don't know how many of them in a certain time period. You know who was terrible at that? Who? Dermonte Dawson. And and nobody would argue that Dermonte Dawson is a bad football player. But could, <laughs> could but barely like said, finish. Yeah. And uh, he finished in Canton. See? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> And got a bust and everything, right, at the yeah. at the finish line. So, I mean, so and that's where it's like when you talk about guys being able to do things and not do things, that's where it comes in where it's like a, a conditioning test is not going to be indicative of football play. But it's just to get a baseline of where this guy is cardiovascularly um, because, like you said, the season is long, games are long, drives are long, and you want to see how guys react to it. But also training camp is a place where you do kind of get your final football shape because you can go lift and run as much as you want, but how do you do that when somebody is opposing you and does not want you running in, in a clear line direction? What would you see from that guy right there? You know, I mean, this guy, God, he, he's, he's such an element, man. I mean, you know, I, I think of what Justin Fields brings just with his legs, the smarts and the athleticism and the strong arm. Um, day one was a good day. I, I love that one. He did a teardrop pass to Van Jefferson down the sidelines uh, for a TD. And you just see the touch that Justin Fields has and the vision that he has. And I think slowing things down, being in this position, he hasn't been in a competition since he's been in the NFL because he was, you know, he was drafted first round to Chicago, the incumbent quarterback from day one, no pressure. And now he's kind of going through the competitive nature of football, which I think is a good thing for him. And right now he's getting the lead tosses. But like you said, when the pads come on, that's when it gets really real. But for day one, I thought he, I thought he did a really good job. Yeah, a couple hiccups. He, he one hopped one, uh, I think, on an in route to, to George Pickens. He said it was a good day. I uh, said he wasn't perfect, but didn't expect to be. I, I'll, I'll pile on on the physical ability thing. I, you know, the Olympics are uh, going on, taking yeah. place in yeah. France. If there was quarterback Olympics, he would be there and he would win the gold medal. I mean, yeah. that's how much ability he has. Now, for whatever reason, he hasn't been able to put it together consistently, and there are a myriad of factors there. But uh, I, just getting an up-close look at him this spring and then, uh, you know, being yeah. around him a little bit since he's come to the Steelers – I'm relatively convinced there's a quarterback in there. Right? <laughs> yeah. When, yes. when is that guy going to emerge? Yeah, I, I think as you get through camp, I mean, new system, once again, that you have to learn and you have to get acclimated to, and new personnel for him. So I think as this camp goes on, I think really by the end of camp, I think like Omar said, how do you look from the first day to the last day? I think Justin Fields is going to really progress nicely because I think he has the weapons. I mean, we just aforementioned, right? You have George Pickens, you have a Pat Fryer move, you have a Calvin Austin, Van Jefferson, Quez Watkins, Jalen Warren, Najee Harris, Darnell Washington, Connor Hay. Like he has all, he didn't have these in Chicago, and he didn't have the offensive line in front of him. And I think that's also a contributing factor. So it's going to be fun to watch him as he starts to gel and starts to gain a connection with these receivers. And we'll see who he gains a connection with the quickest as camp progresses. Yeah, it looks like we're going to see some more of him today. He'd if you were paying close attention to our shot a moment ago, you noticed yeah. Russell Wilson walking into it wearing a baseball cap and not a helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, per, abundance of caution, right? I mean, Russell Wilson has the resume. So, you know, if you want to take a couple extra days during this acclimation period you think to he's get okay? Russ, I think he's okay. It's not going to set him way back. I don't think it sets him way back because you think about how short these practices are. These aren't long practices um, in the acclimation period. It was an hour and a half yesterday. It'll be another hour and a half today. You get through, like, maybe two team periods. So he's missing, all in all, he's missing seven on seven, two team periods. He's missing about 12 to 15 reps, you know, in total. And when you think about a season, that's that's one drive, maybe two drives at the most. I don't, I don't think it's an issue for what Russell Wilson's already been through in the NFL. The acclimation period thing, it's almost like a false start because we yeah. go through the springtime OTAs and the mini camps. And yeah. Uh, and then we take some time off, and everybody is so zeroed in on the opening of training camp and the first practice. But 
it's not in pads, so it's not really. No, this is a re- it doesn't count. Reset. Right? This is like OTA fifteen or whatever it yeah, is. Or th- th- this is like, hey, you know, we've we've got we got light hors d'oeuvres, and then we have heavy hors d'oeuvres, and then we'll get to the entree. Right? We're in the light hors d'oeuvre stage, <laughs> and that's what it is. It's like there's a build up to it. It's like I'm really hungry, but this isn't quite doing it. The the bruschetta toast is not gonna cut it. I need a steak. Did Did you check with Wolf that you're allowed to make a food analogy? Well, I mean, I feel like as the, as the resident big man on set, I, I have that honor regardless, you know, and Wolf well, and I alternate. Well, I'm glad you're here because yeah. not too many times I'm not the resident big man. In <laughs> yeah, my yeah. I like hanging around with you and yeah. Wolf. Like, <laughs> feel Absolutely. a little better about things. There we um, go. <laughs> uh, you heard Omar when he was on with us a few minutes ago talk about Russell Wilson, and this is something that I've heard from almost everybody that I've asked about Russell Wilson. It's work ethic. Everybody knows his statistics. Everybody knows his resume. Everybody knows he's a Super Bowl winning quarterback. I don't know that people knew for sure that this guy was as all in as he appears to be and has appeared to be since getting here in the spring. Well, you called it the Russell Wilson experience, right, with yeah. the interviewing and how, how very methodical he is in that process. And he listed everybody that he's going to throw to at training camp uh, and gave you a little bit about them. But the other thing is – like you said, like he's out here, even though he's got the ball cap on, he's taking reps. He's trying to figure out what he can do and not go too far. And last night, we're walking, you know, walking to dinner. He was on the field doing reps with the trainer to make sure that he was feeling right and that he was going through his motions and his progressions. And I think that's something you normally wouldn't see. It's 630 at night. Why is a guy on the field when he doesn't have to be and he's doing the extra things to make sure that he's ready when he does get the opportunity to put the helmet in and trade in that baseball cap? Yeah, Mike Tomlin talked about him uh, in Tomlin's camp opening press conference about bringing uh, – he's different in the weight room for his position. It, it, yeah. I, I took that to mean he's actually in there working. He, and, he, and he, he actually puts weight on a bar yeah. and moves it. Um, uh, some people just I know in Denver for stretching. Some people I know in Denver. I was trying to check out Russell Wilson when he first became available because yeah. I was curious, and then I was told he was the first guy in the building and the last guy out. Yeah, and, and that that kind of thing resonates with teammates as does the weightlifting. Well, I mean, because you want to make sure that the the presumed leader, right? A quarterback is automatically gifted the title, but then you have to kind of earn the stripes with the title. And that's what that means. If you're the first one in, last one out, that means you care more about this and you care as much as your teammates do about this process. And you're not just trying to do the minimum. And that's what I like, the fact that he goes beyond that and he wants to be the best. He wants to have his little office in the facility so he can watch film. But I think, you know, you come here in Pittsburgh, you can still have that office, just the office is going to have 53 seats in it. And you can sit in there as much as you want but your teammates can also come in. So I think that type of uh, nuance is going to be different for him, but I think he's willing to accept that opportunity because he realizes what the opportunity is here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's something that he's brought up a couple of times as well. They think it's all right there in front of them, although I would suspect most, if not all, teams are feeling pretty good at this time of the year. Well, hey, hope springs eternal, right, at the beginning yeah. of training camp. Everybody, quote-unquote, is, is as healthy as they're going to be, right, <laughs> because you're never as healthy as you are the first day of training camp as you are by the end of the season. And so everybody believes they're going to go 17-0 and and have the number one seed and make it all the way to the Super Bowl and only have to play 20 games. Um, but at the same time, you know, this task and having a guy like Russell Wilson, who has done that, we have to remember this guy has been to two Super Bowls. Yeah, almost He's did it won twi- one. Almost won it twice. Yeah, just a handoff versus a pass. I mean, the difference that makes. And, you know, he understands what it takes to play in the NFC as well as the AFC, right? He had his success in Seattle, came over to Denver, and so he's played in both conferences. He's seen the difference, and he played in a very tough division. When you got Patrick Mahomes in your division, it's a very tough thing to do, and Justin Herbert. Now he's stepping into another tough division where we have a Lamar Jackson, a Joe Burrow, and Deshaun Watson in the division. So he's used to that competition within that smaller um, aspect of the conference. So I'm really, I'm really happy to have a guy like him and that experience at the quarterback position. Can you – Get a, a true handle on how much that experience and his resume resonates with the other players. I mean, I talked to uh, Minka Fitzpatrick about him and Cam Hayward. You know, they actually – Wilson said they were kind of recruiting him uh, yeah. to get him to the Steelers. You know, the been there, done that aspect 
of the quarterback position. That's it's got to be almost invaluable. Yeah, it, it is invaluable. And you add that type of guy in a room with a, a young Justin Fields who has a lot of starting experience, hasn't had the same success as Russell. That kind of helps ease that learning curve for Justin Fields because Justin Fields hasn't really had that successful veteran quarterback in his room um, that he can that he can bend his ear a little bit, that he can talk to him and really go through some of the trials, tribulations, the ups and the downs, and the progression of a season, and somebody that's been doing it for a very long time. I think that's a that's big help for Justin Fields. And then you got a Kyle Allen, another guy who's been in this league for a while and has moved around, and he's a guy that's a complimentary guy. So having this room, I really love. I, I mean, I, I really find myself hard-pressed to find a better room of quarterbacks in the NFL as it stands um, that can compete with this room with the experience and everything else that, that it brings. Of course, uh, even the best of QBs uh, need your buddies up front to get the job done. And That's right. uh, obviously one of the you know running themes and top storylines of this camp is the offensive line. Is it going to continue to transition? Will Zach Frazier uh, move up and become a starter as a rookie? If so, how long is it going to take for that ha to happen? Will Broderick Jones play right tackle? as he ended last year, or will he move to left and will Troy Fatutanu move in as the right tackle? If that's going to happen, when will that happen? Uh, had a chance to talk uh, a little bit yesterday with Broderick Jones just about playing either side and how he prepares to do that and uh, what he thinks is going on up front. Honestly, I really still don't know. Um, you know, I'm just coming out here every day trying to get 1% better, even if it's at left or right, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, do my part, you know, when my name is called on either side, you know, I just want to be prepared. When you look back at last season, do you think you began starting at the right time or do you think you could have handled it game one? Um, I feel like I started at the right time. Uh, I feel like I needed a couple weeks, you know, to actually just sit and watch and just learn and listen and take everything in before I was just able to go out there and, you know, just do what I do what I can. So I feel like me being able to sit down those first couple of weeks really helped me. Um, I really feel like it helped me hone in on my skills. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like it worked out for the best. You end up playing both sides. If it came to uh, switching midseason this year, could you do it? Yes, sir. Without a doubt. You know, I feel like I'm a versatile player. I can play on either side. You know, I've been doing it my whole life. Um, you know, I practice at it each and every day just so I'm always getting reps on both sides because, you know, like you said, you know, I never know. Coaches really probably still don't know. So, um, you know, we just got to let time tell and just continue to just get 1% better. There's so not so much that. talk about this new offense, but how do you guys feel like, yes, it's day one, you're starting to come together based on the work you guys have put in mini camp OTAs? Yeah, I feel like the offense is uh, coming together really well, you know, just like with OTAs and stuff and, you know, like rookie mini camp with those guys, the rookies being able to get in and, you know, get the extra learning curve, um, you know, just coming in and being able to sit down and just take coaching, you know, one-on-one -on -one because, you know, like that's their time. You know, we don't take that time from them. Um, so I just feel like for those guys, that's a really big push right there. Um, you know, it's good that we they, they came into a new system. So I feel like, you know, with the older guys, it, it really don't make a difference, you know. Um, you know, we just try to continue to, stay prepared to play and, you know, just always listening to what the coach is telling you um, because at the end of the day, they really can't – it's X's and O's. You know, football is football. So, you know, you just got to go out there and give 100%. That was really interesting yesterday and hearing him say that, you know, he needed a little time. And, you know, this is a first-round pick and a guy who played at a, a highly regarded program, won a couple national championships, you know. The prototype, if you will. Yeah. But he said he needed some time, and he's happy the way it worked out the way it did. Mike Tomlin says it's different for everybody. It probably is. You know, the, the maturity level and readiness of last year's class might not necessarily be the same as this year's. But uh, I just I found his perspective interesting, as I have since he got here. Because he's always acted like a guy, Max, that, hey, it's going to happen for me eventually. I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to rush it. I'm going to do my job and get my work done and then just kind of let it happen organically. Well, and, and I think that's the right approach. I mean, what you heard from Broderick Jones, I think a lot of rookie going to second year transitional guys need to take note because this isn't a microwave 
of a, of a career, right? It's a slow cooker, and you want to make sure that low and slow, you get better and better every day. You heard him talk about, hey, as long as I get 1% better every day, I, it's going to happen. And that's qu that quiet confidence you have. But there is a jump from college to the pros. And for Broderick Jones, yes, under 20 starts in college, not ideal. But like you said, the athleticism, the immeasurables are off the charts. But for him to have the perspective of not feeling like, oh, my God, i got to start right now um, is, is a great tell. I mean, that's a maturity that he developed over the last year. And even for this rookie class, I know they've played more. But at the end of the day, am I worried about starting day one if I get a 15-year career out of it? Or am I worried about starting day one and then I don't even make it to my second contract because of injuries and everything else? Like, there's a lot of different things where mentality has changed. So that maturity process, we kind of miss that out now because we're like, guys got to come in. They got to be ready to go right now. But it's a progression. Antonio Brown was not Antonio Brown day one. And I know he wasn't a first-round draft he was pick. He year one. Yeah, he wasn't even a year one guy. But you would argue any wide receiver would trade that four-year span where he was the most dominant guy for their entire career stat numbers. So I think that's one of the things that when I look at it, I'm never in a rush to judge a guy just like a quarterback. If we bring in a rookie quarterback, I don't judge him until after year three because you need that time. Offensive linemen don't get hit their prime until year five. Um, and so I'm never in a rush. I'm like, hey, whatever it takes, keep the consistency. Whatever looks good, I don't want it forced that because a guy was drafted in this position, he has to start here. It's the expectations there. But as you get there, I want you to get better. And however you can service this team, that's what you do. I mean, when I came in, my first start was at left guard. And who would have said, hey, Max, you're, you're, six, you're six foot eight. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be a guard for your first start in your NFL career. And I played right tackle for three years. Then I transitioned over to the left side. And that's just kind of how it worked out. And I think for Broderick, for Troy, um, um, you know, it's going to be one of those things where you look at, can this guy just continually get better, and can he make sure he puts his hand in the pile? And I think both those guys are Steeler-type guys. But, you know, the Steelers, defensively, for how many years would John Mitchell on the defensive line not put a rookie in to start him like Cam Hayward until they were really ready? And it took two years to learn the 3-4. So but part of that was rush. also the options available. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, Cam Hayward – there were some guys in front of him. Well, yeah, there was Aaron Smith, and but Aaron Smith didn't start and become Aaron Smith till year three. Brett Kiesel didn't become Brett Kiesel till like year four. So even though you had these other options, Chemo came over from Cincinnati when I came here in 04. Um, you know, James Harrison did not start out as a starter. He was behind Clark Hagens and Joey Porter, and then he eventually he did not start out making the roster three times. <laughs> There we go. And, and who would argue that James Harris is not eventually going to be a Hall of Famer? Forget starting. Yeah, yeah. He got a sandwich in the roadmap. Yeah. They said, Rod 30, he's that way. Well, kid. actually, they sent him to Europe a couple of times. Yeah. Like, hey, you're not even on this continent. I need you to go ahead and move over. Baltimore also cut him Yes. before he became James Harrison. Yes. But, you know, back to the here and now, I, I get the slow cooker thing and the, you got a career to think about thing, but at the same token, these guys were drafted for a reason. And yeah. you, would, you would want your first and your second round draft pick presumably to impact the team, which is hard to do as an offensive lineman if you're not playing because you're not playing a ton of special teams. So let's look at a guy like Zach Frazier, 46 career starts. Broderick Jones had 19. Yeah. Uh, more ready to hit the microwave or wait and see? Well, I think he, 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 he comes in, uh, the oven's preheated for him. <laughs> uh, you know, we, I, I want to avoid microwave meals at all costs. Um, but if, if, you know. In he a hits, pinch, you know, you know, those hot pockets I mean, aren't bad. Listen, they're not bad in a pinch. You're right, in a pinch. But if I have options and I can just drive a mile, yeah. I'm going to go sit down in a restaurant <laughs> like Sharky. <laughs> but, no, um, I think Zach Frazier is better poised. Because, like you said, that experience. And the center really is a lot different than the tackle because those are the guys that are the hive mind for the offensive line. They're the leaders of that group. They have to be able to disseminate the information between all five guys cleanly and fluidly and help the quarterback out. He's the quarterback's spotter, so to speak. He's the first set of eyes that gives the initial call for the quarterback to know what the scene is set for. And then the quarterback goes and he makes the nuanced adjustments, right? He, he's the one that makes sure that, okay, I know you saw this, but since I've been under center, things have shifted a little bit. 
let's make it this call. So for that center position, you really want to see a guy that's mature, that can handle any situation. I think Zach Frazier is poised to do that, but he, he does have a challenge against Nate Herbig, who's been here longer, been in the league longer, so he understands what a 17-game schedule looks like and the body type and the way you treat, treat your body throughout the season. Zach Frazier is going to get a little bit of an acclimation to that, and I think he has the intelligence to do it, but it's the strength and the consistency that we need to see at that level. You know, get back to Jones for a minute. Uh, the other thing that really impressed me, and, and we've talked about this uh, previously, but we did again yesterday, he said he got one or two reps at left tackle in yesterday's practice. Yeah. He couldn't remember if it was one or two. What, yeah, it, it was one each period because he took the he took the last snap of the ones group in the two team period because there's only two team yeah. periods. So, I mean, he got two snaps. And then s somebody asked him, well, is that enough to prepare you? And he said, well, that's one or two today is then the next time it's two to four, then six, then eight. And pretty soon you're getting all this extra work. And I asked him, what if just hypothetical situation, what if they came to you before the week four game and said, you know what? You're switching from right to left tackle this week. Could you do it? He, he said, absolutely. He, he's no issues on his end whatsoever with doing that if it comes to that. Not saying it's going to happen, but. Yeah, I mean, but that, but that, that's what that's what you have to prepare for as an offensive line. You have to be ready to play anywhere. I mean, my rookie year, you know, I wasn't starting per se until the end of the year, um, the last game before we started the playoffs. But I had to be able to prepare for every position. So it wasn't just right tackle or left tackle. It was right guard, left guard, everything but center because that takes a special guy. Because you only dress seven on game day. Well, I'm not too many six eight centers either. I mean. But once again, if you're if you're the last guy on the roster because somebody went down and somebody else went in and there's only seven of you, uh, you know, I remember when I got injured um, one game, they had Matt Spath getting ready to take snaps because we had no more offensive linemen. So you just kind of prepare for the inevitable. Like, I have to be ready to play because I'm an offensive lineman and I can fill in anywhere, and that's the mentality you have to have. So I appreciate that in Broderick Jones, and I'm sure this offseason he worked both sides, both sets, because you want to make sure you keep that mental and physical flexibility inside because you don't want to get fixated on one set and one style with your hips because your hips have to shift, and that's way too in the weeds for this broadcast. But you want to make sure you're keeping yourself as Actually, versatile as possible. Actually, for this broadcast, the weeds don't exist. We're, we're all Okay, in. well, I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't see any weeds on that field on the screen. Yeah, okay. But, yeah, but physiologically. But I mean, this is inside baseball. This yeah, is, yeah, 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 th this Please is that be moment. Please as detailed as <laughs> yeah, you yeah, care to okay. be. <laughs> No, it just it comes with the stance and the set, right? If you do something so many times, your hips set in that direction and they get shifted. So the long muscles in in your legs get shorter on the, your your what we call the plant leg, the inside leg on the side that you're on, and then the other muscles stay o almost overextended. So then when you switch, the muscle memory's not there and you tend to kick back the wrong way. The wrong direction and you open and invite if you don't practice both sides of the ball. So that's one of the things that, you know, for Broderick, I'm sure he said, okay, I need to practice both of these because you don't want to hinge and open up the inside and give them a clear path because you're redirecting on a secondary move from a pass rusher. So that's one of the things that makes it tough in transition for a lot of guys because, like, I'm a left tackle and I'm just a left tackle. I'm a right tackle and I'm just a right tackle or a guard. Like, it's like, no, you're an offensive lineman. You need to cross-train on both sides and work yeah. both sides of your mind and yet, so that you're ready and for flexible. some guys, I mean, Dan Moore has been very open the last couple of years. He doesn't really like playing right tackle. Yeah. And yeah. He doesn't think he's very good at it. Well, I mean, because you get thrown in as a rookie and it's like you have to start at left tackle. You have to play every snap. And he's done that a whole bunch of times he's, the last yeah, three years. He's, huh? yeah, he's had all – he's started every game and been in that position. So it's like you have to – at a point, you have to then settle in and say, I want to work on my craft because I know that I'm dyed in the wool in this position. But for Broderick, right, you know, and a lot of offensive linemen, if you have a, if you have a standing left tackle that you're coming into, you got to play the right side or you have to be flexible to play any of the other three out of the four positions for the tackle position. You know, you're not Graham Barton, right, uh, the rookie from, from Duke, who's like, I'm, I'm a left tackle, but I play center. It's like, what? <laughs> so it's a transition. Another thing that uh – Jumped out uh, to me, at least, during yesterday's practice. Uh, the number of times they threw to the tight end and the number of times they deployed multiple tight ends. Max, I don't know if you noticed that, but I know Pat Fryermuth did. Yeah, just doing different things, getting used to it, getting on the same page with the quarterbacks. Um, it feels great, and uh, 
Um, I'm looking forward to this year. Brad, how much did you guys go multi-tight end in team today? A lot, yeah. I think the uh, majority of it was, you know, 12-13. And, um, it was great to, to, to utilize all of us. You know, Prue had a hell of a catch on a stick nod, and Darnell had a catch, and, and it was Connor, and it was good to get us all involved today. You okay with that? Of course, whatever wins this game. What, you, what, what is that bring? What, what's the uh, attraction? It, it, it was able to uh, make matchups better um, against defenses, uh, you know, kind of pigeonhole defenses, what to do, um, you know, and, and know what we're going to get for looks so we can exploit those looks. You know, Max, we spent a little bit of time talking about this topic yesterday. Yes, we did. And I don't know if you remember or not, but I'm kind of in favor of multiple tight ends, two no, at a time, three really? at a time. And, uh, 12 and 13 personnel. Thank you. We're glad we got that cleared up. It's almost as if they let me write the script. That's how many times they threw to the tight ends yesterday. I mean, you know, we talk about the people that watch these broadcasts, and I wonder if the coaches just have a little radio in their ear. They're like, what is Mike going to say? Yeah, it's probably not know, the case. I mean, it could be. You know, Arthur Smith, might, he might be a fan of might be a fan. I, I talk to him enough. They don't listen to me then. I yeah. don't think that. <laughs> yeah. But, no, you're right. I mean, in fact, during during our broadcast right after this uh, on SNR. Uh, Ask Terrell Austin how many times I asked him last year, when the hell are you going to start Joey Porter? Yeah, yeah and, and then he finally did it. <laughs> he finally did it. He finally did it. You wore him down. But, yeah, we counted <laughs> five passes to Pat Fryer move yeah. um, alone. And I think that's something where – was a departure from last year's season, and across, and also most of those were across the middle of the field. Thank you. So, you know, I think this is a different approach. And Pat, Pat is one of those guys that he is an exceptional receiver. He knows how to get open. He has the body. Exceptional. I mean, yeah. This guy's numbers do not give an accurate portray yeah. portrayal of his potential so far. No. Not that he's been bad, but I think he could be a star. He can. I mean, he has. You know, and, and it's funny. I was talking to. Uh, Troy's son, Paisios uh, Palomalu. Uh, I was talking to him yesterday, and Paisios was like, hey, Uncle Max, uh, you know, how do you see Pat Fry? I'm like, he could be the number two receiver in targets if if they play their cards right. And I think that's kind of the difference and the departure from what last year's system was to now what this year's system is because there is no Deontay Johnson. He's gone. And so now there is a void for who's going to take that target share, who's going to be that guy that's going to step up. And I think for Pat – this is the perfect system where you could see Pat. You could see Darnell Washington, Connor Hayward. Heck, all three of those tight ends could get, could get a lift in their numbers, even though Arthur Smith's system is more geared towards running. They could see a lift in their numbers from the previous year, and they can actually impart a big part and element to this offense because they are mismatch. All three of them are mismatches when they're on the field, and especially when they're together in packages of two and three. You don't have enough linebackers. You don't have enough safeties that can cover for all of those guys. You know, I think with Washington, it's it's especially important that they start throwing the ball. One, because I think he has a huge catch radius. And I he think does. He can get you X number of yards if you need them. You know, yeah. five. So play action boot. Oh, there's the huge guy. Throw it to the Empire State Building. Uh, Eight-yard gain, first down. Connor Hayward, I think, can be a – gadget's probably not the right word, but – he, he, he's a uh, pinball. He's, he's that he's that he's that X factor type of guy, right? He can be a screen guy. Playmaking, get, across get the him the middle, get him yeah. in space, get him the ball. He'll do some things for you. Now, if you get to the point where these guys are in the game, and the other team doesn't know if you're going to run or pass, I think that's a huge advantage for the offense. Well, it, it's going to be a huge advantage. And let's face it, Darnell Washington, wherever he catches the ball, say he doesn't get any yak, he's still going to get yak. Because he falls forward, that's two extra yards. Like he's that tall. Four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If he yeah. stretches, if he stretches six. yeah, yeah, you got some back. So that that's something that I, I don't think was really appreciated a year ago. And I think hopefully, you know, that's something that's been imparted. And we'll see that as we get to more seven shots and we get to these more yeah. competitive team drills where he could be an asset. And like you said yesterday, red zone is like 87, 87, 87. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like you have to zone in on that guy and – you hope the attention goes to him because then you can alleviate 488, 483, 422. You can alleviate for these other guys on the field uh, because he's going to draw natural attention being a walking skyscraper. You know, the word on him when he was coming out last year, I mean, he didn't catch the ball much at Georgia either, but that's because yeah, Brock there's, Bowers. A, there's a ridiculous <laughs> yeah, array of yeah. weapons at yeah. every position, including his. But yeah. coming here, I, the expectation was, well, he, he might be one of those guys who does better statistically in the pros than in college, catching in yards-wise and TDs yeah. and that kind of thing, just because of the environment. that he's like. I don't want to say the Steelers don't have as much talent as Georgia, but yeah. 
Maybe but, not. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. But for that level, like well, it, relatively and, and speaking, we got we got two guys that are offensive weapons from Georgia, and then we have an offensive lineman from Georgia. So they're doing something good that we're bringing so many guys from the University of Georgia. When you think about your your starting tackle and Broderick Jones, a first round pick, George Pickens, Darnell Washington. Obviously, there's something they like, and there's traits that Georgia exhibits. And I think Darnell Washington is one of those guys. Like you said, he was oft underused because you had Brock Bowers, who was a generational tight end. Um, and at receivers that like Pickens and, and, yeah, and ridiculous running backs. You, you like tall, backs long and, guys that make yeah. crazy circus catches. Um, yeah. So I think Darnell is more traditional in that sense, but he's a guy that's just as fast and bigger and I think can plow and get you those extra yards in the middle of the field as long as you're not scared to throw there. I talked to Alfredo Roberts, the position coach uh, at Mandatory Veteran Minicamp, and he was happy to talk about a touchdown pass that Darnell Washington caught from Russell Wilson. And yeah. uh, I can't yeah. remember if it was seven shots or red zone or something, but um, that option exists. I mean, it, yeah. even if you don't dial him up uh, as, as the primary, uh, I can remember out here last year when Mitch Trubisky was quarterbacking and things started to break down, he'd start running around and look for number 80 because it was the easiest, safest throw. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the dude is humongous. And how do you how do you <laughs> not use a humongous option is, uh, is kind of beyond me. But like I said, we're in the position we're in, and I think we're in a better position from a year ago to where people realize that there are some, some hidden weapons and hidden gems that were underused a year ago. All right. Did you like the impact? Uh, I'm going to keep harping on the tight ends for a while because why not? Yeah. Uh, yeah they when they right there on the screen. When they why went not? to the three as often as they did at the end of the year, do you yeah. think that was somewhat uh, due to the weather and poor conditions and it was tougher to pass at that time? Or do you think just, they just decided, you know what, if nothing else, we're going to run this football and then see what we can do after that? Now, I, I think there was a commitment to running weather – permitting or however you want to look at it when you get to the end of the year you tend to run the ball more than you pass it just because the weather elements and if it's cold it the ball doesn't fly as much as you want it to hands of the quarterback trying to hold said ball uh make it a little tough and I think that's that's a way if you think about building off of last year now you have those options because you know all three of them are capable pass catchers yeah and so it's like, but that said, if, I think if we have to do two ways, if it's a, and you could send a run pass in, yeah. and we call those kill plays or option plays. It's like we come in for the run, but if you see what you like, dial up the dial up the pass, and just it's a one or a two call, or you'll say kill, kill, kill at the line. That'll send it to the second option. That said, I think my favorite play of the year last year was the Najee Harris touchdown run in Seattle where the three tight ends were all pushing him from behind. Yes, the scrum, the scrum style push at the end. That, that, it, that, it was, that was like the awesome. Philly thing on steroids because they didn't just do a sneak. They <laughs> yeah, they handed it off and then came with four guys essentially and created like a spear. No, I, I, I love that aspect. And like you said, you have to just be creative and open to it. I think a lot of times, you know, coordinators kind of fall in love with the with the philosophy versus the actual – presence of what your personnel is and i think if yeah, you're a coach yes yeah right and i get yeah. why that happens because they probably had success with it and they think it's pretty yeah. good but that's the trick isn't it marrying yeah. what you want to do with what you can do yeah with what you got and, and that's the thing it's like hey no, i don't mean I, that I, as I, a criticism yeah. of oh, coordinators. No, 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 i think no. that's a natural uh dynamic that's at play when you have that job yeah it, it's a natural inclination because you want to fall on what you feel most comfortable with and every coach, just like players, we talk about when guys go native, right? You know, it's like you revert back to what you feel most comfortable with. Going native being go off the yeah. script and try yeah. to make a play that you're not supposed to. Yeah, because you're going more, off of your trust. Do yeah. more than your job, and then that just helps break everything down. It doesn't help. Yeah, it doesn't help everybody as opposed to saying, let's play within this system of what we have. And if I got three really good tight ends, I want to utilize all three of those tight ends as often as I can because I feel like I can be successful. Or if it's just two tight ends and I like my two receivers as well, then let's go with that. But make sure that you're consistent in that process and that you are giving yourself the best opportunity based on who you have. I would love to run five wide personnel and have everybody look like George Pickens run yeah. down the field. Yeah, that, 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 that's a pipe dream, but 
we don't have five George Pickens. We got one. The run and shoot yeah. was fun when you had Warren Moon. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, heck, we did it when I was at Florida with, Re with Rex Grossman as our quarterback. Yeah. We had a complement of receivers that all went to the league. Taylor Jacobs, Rache Caldwell, Jabbar Gaffney and company. I mean, we had a lot of guys. So, But that's where I think the, the nuance is, and I think that was what the shift was after Matt Canada was relieved of duty. You saw coaches that said, you know what? We're going to use what we got, and we're just going to run with it. And I loved how they built they built on it week after week, and that's what got them in the playoffs. Let's uh, switch gears and talk about the inside linebacker position a little bit because that's, uh, well, I'll just be perfectly transparent. That's another obsession of mine yeah. here in training camp 2024. Uh, nickel versus dime, guys who can run and cover and also play the run. Uh, obviously, you know, the more – Really good linebackers have the better off you are. So my question to you, with Patrick Queen, the vet, and Peyton Wilson, the rookie, joining the team, are they now uh, in a position where if they want to play more nickel than dime, they are capable of doing that? Yeah, I, I, I think they are. I mean, and, and listen, a year ago, we were primed to play nickel, but then we lost, like, all of our linebackers, it felt like, within a two-week span <laughs> at the end of the season. And it was like... Well, we only got dime. And it's like, you know, drop Damani KZ down and have him play, you know, a dime linebacker because we're out of physical linebackers. And you try to bring – we were bringing guys in constantly. But I think coming into camp, when you think about the pedigree, the youth of the guys that's in that room, because of Patrick Queen is a veteran but yet a younger veteran, that, that bodes well. You drafted Peyton Wilson to come in, and the kid can fly around all day. So I like where we're at. And then you still got an Landon Roberts. You still got a Cole Holcomb. Uh, that's going to be consistent guys that were here a year ago that are tried and true vets that can now fill in the gap. So now you got a compliment and you can really create a dynamic rotation to where you don't have to put that rookie out there every down. You can make him more nickel versus base package guy because you have the vets like a Landon Roberts in here. What he did last year, I didn't know he could cover the way he covered when he had to. Yeah, you know, they were running out of guys, as you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, exactly. They're pretty much down to, hey, it's got to be you because we have nothing else. There's nothing else in the cover. <laughs> I, I, I thought he was just heroic last year, uh, no, second mean, half of the season. And, you know, I got to spend time with Alanda this offseason. Um, we were down in Mexico for, for the draft. Did you guys go bib overall shopping together? Or? I, I did not. Um, apparently, <laughs> they come wide. They don't come necessarily wide and tall. Oh, okay. So it was either high waters or, or skinny overalls, which I don't think is a, is a trend yet, and I don't want to start that. <laughs> but no, nonetheless, uh, he's a guy who's going to be maybe yeah. more in the mix because of what he did last year. Well, and, and the production's there, and he has the pedigree. I mean, this guy's also – he's been in the Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Like, he has that experience. So, when you're talking about having experience and depth at every position, he's a guy that adds that depth and that experience for you that automatically gives your inside linebacking core a lot more creditability. Even though I know Patrick Queen and what he's done in Baltimore – has been noted, and we were able to take him from a, from a division rival. And Landon Roberts is really that vet leader that kind of brings both together. And I think he's a guy that when you're talking about who's the leader of that inside linebacking court, it's going to be him uh, from day one. Speaking of Patrick Queen, this is kind of off topic a little bit, but uh, he showed up uh, his press conference after signing here and said he's going to be the villain. You know, he used yeah. to be – on the Ravens, now he's on the Steelers, so he's going to be the villain because that's what he was in Baltimore. Uh, Deshaun Elliott, safety from Baltimore, said he's going to be the rowdy guy. Uh, he doesn't think the Steelers' defense had enough of that last year, the, the rowdy element. Yeah. Uh, bounced that off of Cam Hayward yesterday, and he said, oh, once we get in pads, the smack talk will go way up. Those guys just haven't seen us in pads yet. It's only been OTAs and, and that kind of thing. So we're, we're well stocked there. What? What is the value of smack talk, particularly out here when it's Steeler on Steeler? Uh, how competitive should it get? How competitive does it get? And do you always have to keep in the back of your mind, okay, this, we're only taking this so far today because that guy, after all, is my teammate. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there's a certain measured um, rage you have, to, you have to possess when pads come on. And, because, like you said, it's Steeler on Steeler. At the end of the day, Yes, this guy is my enemy on the field, but at the end of the day, that, that's my brother in the locker room, and that's the guy I need to depend on for 17-plus games in a season. So I need to make sure that he's in a position to where we're giving enough competitive that he's ready to play a game, 
But at the same time, I don't need to injure him to where he can't make it to that game. So there's a fine line. But, yes, Smack Talk is all is all available on the menu as long as you don't hit below the belt. Um, and those questions, save that for game day talk. Yeah, yeah, certain subjects you don't broach. But I mean, with everything else, here I mean, about their masculinity, I, I could definitely. I mean, you, you question their masculinity, you question their toughness. You know, do, do you pillow fight in the off season? Apparently, that's what you're good at. You know, those type of things <laughs> you can get into. It's like, okay, are those cleats or those smooth bottoms? Because you keep sliding backwards. You know, you can make those type of jokes and just, but you can't, you can't hit below the belt. You does save it, that. Do you think of them the night before, or does it just sort of come out? You got to be off the cuff. You know, yeah. it's just like a stand-up comedian that wants to that wants to heckle the crowd. You know, you just have to be ready for whatever it is. Ah, yellow shirt. You know, you know, just go, you just go with it in the moment. You don't sit there and you stock them. I mean, now some guys have to prep because if they don't have great comebacks, they'll pre- they'll prep at night. But most of us usually just go off the cuff. Yeah. Hey, it's a bit of a special day here today, Max. I don't know if you're aware or not. I was not till I got okay. here. But uh, happy birthday, Joey Porter Jr. Hey, hey. JPJ, happy B day. I mean, what better way would you want to celebrate your birthday than uh, a lot of ways? Than, 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 on, than on a field, sweating. <laughs> to be honest with you, r- running and chasing other other grown men and trying to prevent them from being successful. I think we got a Joey Porter tweet. Uh, if we can get to it, uh, perhaps we cannot. But uh, happy birthday, Joey Porter Jr. Year two, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mentioned this still on the team. I still mentioned team. it took a little <laughs> while for him to get into the starting lineup last year. Uh, he's in it now. Yeah. Oh, he, he is. He is well cemented as a starter. And I think that's one of the most important things is that, you know, you see that development. We talk about that growth and that jump from year one to year two. I thought Joey was on a steady, um, you know, incline throughout the season as he got more opportunities he shined in the, in the opportunities he got early when he wasn't a starter and then as he became a starter you saw him really develop he was contesting guys and as a young iso island corner he was going to get the challenge and yes he had he had some penalties along the way but that's the growth that you need that's necessary to being an elite corner you're gonna have mess ups against these guys who are vets but at the end of the day he was still progressing and i really loved his progress Got uh, a report from down on the practice field from our Steelers.com colleague, Dale Lawley. Max, they did seven shots today. Okay. Didn't do it yesterday, did it today. The defense wins four to three. Okay. I mean, ex- that's to be expected. Brand new offense, brand new quarterbacks, uh, throwing to brand new personnel and defense. A lot has not changed. I mean, you had some turnover, but that's a veteran group up front. So you kind of expect that. And there's no pads. And, uh, as we uh, saw yesterday, uh, Beanie Bishop, the uh, undrafted rookie from West Virginia via Minnesota, via West Liberty or Western Kentucky. He's been a lot of places. He's been a lot of places, but he's getting a look at that uh, nickel spot. Uh, Camp Sutton yeah. unavailable for the first eight games uh, via league suspension. And uh, Beanie Bishop got some looks yesterday in the three cornerbacks nickel. Deshaun Elliott got some looks in the three safeties nickel, the big nickel. Yeah. So, I mean, and th- that's something we're going to have to monitor because, right, you have Cam Sutton, but you don't have him for the first half of the season. And to be honest, uh, where would I rather have Cam Sutton? I'd rather have him at the last half of the season because division play does not start How's that week schedule 10. look now? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> week 10 through 18. It's like you got six division games and you got Philly and Kansas City in between those. That is a gauntlet to run the end of the year. So you'd like to be able to in, infuse some new guys into it. And I think Cam Sutton, being the veteran that he is, being able to come in at that point is going to be a real lift um, in that secondary. Steelers, of course, are going to uh, unveil their Hall of Honor uh, class for 2024 tomorrow. And uh, that being the case, uh, we've got a Yin's chat question for you. Over, under... Uh, 1.5 defensive Hall of Honor inductees. What do you think? Got to be retired three years. Uh, plus, I'm taking the over. It's going to be two guys. Okay, I'm going to recuse myself because I'm actually on the committee. Uh, what? what did, why, did we, why did we have a Yin's chat that you can't even participate in? So now well, I got to debate by myself. Yeah. Yeah, because you can't say anything. I can't. Yeah, so I'm going over. Know. I'm going over. And I'm not in the debate committee, but I feel like I'm looking in your eyes and I think it's two guys. That announcement is going to be tomorrow at 1 p.m., and uh, we will have plenty on that here uh, at Steelers.com and all the Steelers uh, social uh, and digital 
platforms. Uh, of course, we've also got the wrap-up show coming up uh, today following practice. That'll be uh, at 3 o'clock. That's myself and Craig Wolfley. Oh, well, that'll be fun. Just let me know. Uh, send me a text or a tweet during it. Or, uh, you know, I can come under the tent. I can just watch you guys, and I can heckle you, you in could, the background. Yeah. You could. I could do that. Uh, we, we can perform under – well, I can perform under pressure. Huh? W- now, Wolf will giggle. Wolf will giggle. Definitely yeah. will giggle. What are you looking forward to today? What do you want to see? You know, one of the things, I just want to see some clean play. I know yesterday there was a couple of fumble snaps offensively, so I would like to see some clean play from the uh, fr- from the center position. Clean sheet, no fumbles, quarterback, CQ exchanges. I want to see perfection. And then also just kind of watch the progression. I think, like you said, watching the linebackers, how does Peyton Wilson fit in in the regular down situations versus the sub package stuff? Can he be an every down guy? And then I think also watching the offensive linemen, I mean, just how that rotation works because the physicality can't be graded until they have pads on. Now ask me what I want to see. What do you want to see, Mike? Today, Bunch today? of tight ends on the field, <laughs> throwing it to them as often as possible. That's going to do it for us today. I want to thank Omar Khan, the Steelers general manager, for being with us today. And uh, don't forget, we've got the wrap-up show Coming up at 3 o'clock today, myself and Craig Wolfley will bring you that. Uh, So until then, thanks for finding us. Please do so again. This has been Training Camp Live presented by FedEx. Have a great day, everybody.